Uh, so welcome everyone to this fireside chat organized by the Access to Medicine Foundation and the Hemsley Charitable Trust. Uh, my name is Claudia Martinez and I lead the foundation's work on our research stream on access to diabetes care. And for over the last decade, the Access to Medicine Foundation has worked to incentivize and mobilize the pharmaceutical industry to expand access to medicine in low and middle income countries through our research and also through our change making activities. Today, we're here to discuss uh, a very important and a very pressing problem uh, of access to insulin, specifically the wide and persistent gaps that we see in low and middle income countries where this essential medicine continues to be out of the reach for many people. The foundation recently launched uh, a new research report which really underscores the urgency of the situation and shines a spotlight on how three of the leading insulin manufacturers, as well as one manufacturer of biosimilar insulins are taking steps to address this, pro this problem. And I'm joined today um, in this conversation by Dr. Gina Yostratidou. Uh, she's program director at the Hemsley Charitable Trust where she leads their type one diabetes program. Uh, Gina, thank you so much for joining us today. And, and before we start the conversation, I really would like to hand over to you first uh, to explain a bit more about your role at Hemsley and how you're working to tackle some of the challenges that we see in access to diabetes care. Thank you, Claudia. And I'm so happy, actually, and honored uh, to be here with you today as we mark the launch of this important and timely report on the urgent need to strengthen the global, the global access to life-threatening, uh, to, to life-saving insulin. <laughs> Uh, our type 1 diabetes program is dedicated to help uh, the T1D community and people with type 1 diabetes to live safer, better, and more fulfilling lives, while we fund cost-effective and more impactful solutions for a better tomorrow. The Access to Medicines Foundation report clearly details the access challenges that faced by those living with diabetes, but also shows the way forward. I'm excited to explore and discuss these opportunities with you and see how we can do together as a global community can to do more things, more activities to improve the lives of people with type 1. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. And I'm also very much looking forward to, to the conversation today. And I actually wanted to start uh, with sort of the multiplicity of issues that we see uh, in access to, to insulin, right? So insulin has been around for 100 years. Yet we know that millions of people today do not access and cannot really afford insulin. In many cases, it's very expensive for them to be able to afford it. Uh, the situation is particularly worrisome for those who live in the poorest countries in the world, uh, who most of the time have a limited choice of treatments and where we know that the burden of diabetes is also rising quite rapidly. Um, and we know that this is going to pose important issues and questions, both for healthcare systems in low and middle income countries, but also for people who live with diabetes themselves, right? Uh, the market continues to be heavily concentrated with three players dominating uh, the global market for insulin and also supplying significant volumes uh, in low and middle income countries. So it is a multifaceted problem uh, for which action is urgently needed in, in I would say, also long overdue. So we, before we start delving into the report and the actions, um, I think it's valuable to see and, and actually to bring some of these numbers and statistics into context. So I was wondering if you maybe can tell me a bit about what it means to live with type 1 diabetes and not being able to access insulin and, and how is this worse for people uh, who live in the poorest countries in the world? You know, we have the opportunity through our global access portfolio to fund a number of projects in low and middle and income countries. And there is no better way actually to see the impact of our project than to go and visit the people who we serve. So a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, yeah. uh, we went to Malawi and on the beautiful hills of the Nino district in Malawi. Uh, we met a lot of young people who were, we were receiving actually insulin because of the Pen Plus clinic in the, in the area. Otherwise, they would not have access. But what I think some, uh, there was a young mother of three children uh, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. 
and her story really had a long impact on me. So we went to visit her little house uh, up in a beautiful, beautiful hill in a beautiful day. We're sitting there with her and the young and three young children, babies to three or four years old. And we talked about uh, her type one diabetes, how she was diagnosed, that it took a long time. And then we said, do you have insulin? And she said, yes, I'm one of the lucky ones because I can get it from the clinic. Yeah. But then as, as we said, when was the last time you took your uh, insulin? And she said, three days ago. We were all so surprised. And the reason is because she was facing food, food insecurity. This experience actually really reminds us that despite individual differences, young people faced similar obstacles. Poor people with type 1 diabetes or any other disease, they are deeply impacted by lack of access, access to care. But if they don't know where or when they will have food on the table, maybe access to insulin, access to care is not enough to give them quality, good quality of life. Yeah. We know that, you know, many households, as you know, in the low and middle income countries, they face, they have to bear, excuse me, they have to bear the financial burden of continuous and chronic treatment and care. So they are trapped in the cycles of poverty that makes the hope of universal health coverage a distant reality. One thing I wanted to make very clear, and I, I, you said it at the beginning of this conversation, it is important that in global in the global health arena, we must work together. We must have a holistic approach because the issue is not that you have only three companies. The issue is about forecasting. The issue is about healthcare authorities. It's, it's so many or so many of issues. So I think improving the lives of people with chronic diseases it takes a lot more than one action. Yeah, and I think I think that's very true. And I think it's really sad to hear the stark reality of people who who have to make these tough choices between buying food or, or purchasing insulin, because that is what actually happens uh, in some of these countries, right? Um, I think some of the things, uh, and I really I, I would like to echo your point around, yeah, it's not about just a few players, it's it's a systems-wide approach that is actually mm -hmm. needed. And something that we um, highlight in this report is that despite the challenges that we see, we do find some opportunities uh, that I think it's valuable to, to start discussing now. So uh, we, we highlight some things that we feel uh, are critical for catalyzing action in the future. I think it's a good moment, right? I think when we started uh, this paper, I think one of the key questions that we were asking ourselves was why now? Right? Why is this a key moment to make progress on expanding access to insulin? And, and we have seen, I think, greater prioritization at the global level with the World Health Organization um, Diabetes Compact. Uh, we have seen targets adopted at the World Health Assembly that really set out a roadmap uh, for action at the international level, but also at the local level. So something that governments can also take forward. Uh, also the inclusion of long acting analogs on the essential medicines list has the potential, uh, obviously things need to happen, uh, for, for other things need to be in place for it to happen, but essentially to increase competition in the insulin market and also real uh, bring real and, and more choice to people living with diabetes. And I was wondering from your experience and from what you see, how, how do you see these opportunities playing out in the coming years? So I think, you know, we all coming out of a huge pandemic uh, that had such a global impact. But I, I believe the pandemic brought up the issues, the challenges yeah. that we discussed. And I believe that 2022, it was really a landmark year for non-communicable diseases because there is, as you said, right, all, all the, the what you just said, the voice of people who sense this is loud. And I believe that health, uh, healthcare uh, providers, policy makers, funders, they have heard it. They have heard about the burden of NCDs. As you said, we see the Global Diabetes Compact Forum, all right, to bring collective vision to advocacy and collaboration. 
But I think beyond what you said about all these different activities, I think the private sector will be a critical partner in keeping this momentum going forward. We are very eager to support efforts to, pre to provide support for best-in-class products to be registered in yeah. low- and middle-income countries and be integrated in public health systems. Yeah, and I think, thank you, thank you, Gina. And I think I'm glad that you bring in the point around uh, the role of industry in yes. expanding access to products, right? Uh, and this is also a nice segue into uh, the point that I wanted to bring up next, which is uh, some of the findings from our report, uh, what this rep report finds uh, more specifically in terms of what companies are doing in terms of access and how far they're going with these efforts. Um, so I wanted to share some of the key results with this uh, from this work and then maybe also hand over to you to, to kind of discuss how these findings resonate with the work that you have done and the examples that you have seen from industry also. Um, so maybe just to go back um, into some of the key findings uh, from, from this study. Uh, I think for us, it was worrisome to see how many low and middle income countries today uh, do not have insulins available. And I think this comes back to your point around the need of registering these products more broadly. Uh, we looked at 108 low and middle income countries. Um, these are the countries where the access gaps are the greatest. Uh, and we found that we know human insulins are by far the most broadly registered. However, we still see gaps uh, in access, particularly in the poorest countries, the low income countries, right? Uh, I think when it comes to analogs, we found that only two thirds of the countries uh, that we assessed had these insulins um, registered. Uh, and 10 countries only had human insulins. So we do see that there are still gaps uh, to work towards and, and, and progress to be made in terms of um, sort of improving registration and enabling choice for all of the products for these patients. And we did find also that 24 countries had no insulins registered, right? So this is sort of a very um, sort of stark reminder that in some, in some countries you wouldn't have this availability of products. Um, I think the second point that I think it's important, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it, um, is, is sort of the approaches that companies are taking to improve access, right? So we do see that companies, uh, and in this paper particularly, we assessed uh, the actions of Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk, Sanofi, and one by a similar manufacturer, Biocon. Uh, we do see that companies are taking action indeed to, to address some of the challenges, right? Through insulin donation programs, some pricing strategies, uh, some of these strategies include price ceilings as, as Novo Nordisk and, and Biocon would do. Uh, we also see some more comprehensive strategies to actually price products based on ability to pay. Uh, but many of the strategies continue to be focused on human insulins uh, and not yet really covering the more expensive analogs. Um, so people in LMIC for the most part uh, are not yet having the choice of products that they need. Um, and I think for, for us, the bottom line is that uh, while these initiatives, and obviously I'm not going into the full detail of the report, we have much more in terms of what, what companies do, is that even though they're making a difference uh, for people living with diabetes in low and middle income countries, they are not yet enough to fully tackle the extent of the problem, right? There are some positive steps. Uh, we see some companies, particularly Novo Nordisk, uh, through their eye care initiative, and then Sanofi also with their global health unit, sort of making steps to move away from fragmented initiatives to uh, more integrated business models for access. Um, but I think it comes back to the point that you were mentioning earlier, right? Uh, action needs to be made at scale and also with more participation from the whole ecosystem mm -hmm. of players. So I'm curious to hear sort of your thoughts and your take on this uh, findings from our report uh, and what you see also from, from your work. I mean, I have to say, Claudia, that as you speak, you know, my reaction is, the immediate reaction is that imagine, you know, you have a child in these countries that insulin is not registered. What do you do for your child if he has type 1 diabetes? It's a death sentence. And that for me is, is really, really frustrating. But I don't, I don't want to be negative. I believe, as we said earlier, there is a momentum. And we see actually how impactful industry partners can be in supporting key donation, pricing, and health system strengthening initiatives to bring insulin to every individual living with type 1. So 
I, I think, so I want to give you an example. Yeah. Last year, we, uh, we have supported actually for many years uh, a donation program, an insulin donation program, Life for a Child. And last year, they partnered with Eli Lilly to expand the access to insulin to almost 150,000 150, uh, children in 65 countries by 2030. In addition of the, uh, the, 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 the gift, it was 2.4 million vials of insulin, but also Lilly covered the cost of arranging, packaging, and shipping of these essential products. This is an incredibly significant uh, project that shows how industry partners can really help and open the pathways, pathway for access to insulin. But this is not the norm. As you have shown in your report, initiatives are often fragmented and fail to establish a sustained access for ongoing, going, ongoing lifelong treatment. The report shows clearly that the insulin market is highly consolidated and it's most affordable for, for human insulin. We know that analogs are extremely expensive for, for, for anyone, for, for anyone in the low and middle income country. But I want to make sure and I, that actually the responsibility of making access to insulin for everyone, it's not only responsibility of the, of the companies, of, of industry. Industry is one part of the equation. We have to know the governments actually and health, health, some health authorities must pave the, the way to forecast uh, insulin demand, but also update their guidelines for care. But we should not forget also that the voices of people with type 1 diabetes, they have to continue being very loud they have to champion initiatives that yeah. aim at streamlining regulations and scaling up access. I think that I believe that the, the report is really critical and as I said, a timely report, but we should, forget again, we should not forget that it's a system change. So we need industry, government, and people. Exactly, yeah, I, I would absolutely, um, agree on that point, Gina, because I think we see, so uh, even talking about the cost implications and the cost that we see for, for some of these products, we know that sort of, uh, it's, it is well known that markups and tariffs along the supply chain are also impacting costs for patients. And then there are opportunities for greater collaboration to happen and actual, actually for governments to collaborate more uh, to address some of these challenges as well, right? Uh, the other point that we bring in quite strongly in the report is, it is important, again, as a systems level approach, that people only are not only gaining access to affordable insulin, uh, but also to other products that they need, right? It's not about insulin alone, they need glucometers and test strips, which can also impose a lot of costs, right? So it is about um, developing this continuum of care uh, and really understanding and, and, and ensuring that people have the access that they need. Um, and, and I think one of the things that you've been highlighting um, Sort of throughout the conversation is sort of the importance of partnerships and in that sense in the report itself we highlight how companies are implementing sort of new partnerships uh, not only with governments but also with local organizations with suppliers of diagnostic and monitoring monitoring tools to really address some of these deeper challenges and i think we've seen lately some of the potential of these integrated approaches uh, that can also be be applied not in one country but taken and replicated more broadly to to address um, challenges at scale. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, I, I was wondering sort of how, how, how can you, do you have any views particularly in, on, on what these meaningful partnerships need to look like, right? How do we go from just ad hoc collaborations to something that is really going to strengthen healthcare systems and it moves beyond just one single initiative? So I think partnerships, it's such a, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite discussions actually, because for me, when I talk about partnerships, I really want to talk about meaningful partnerships. Yeah. And you know, often you hear like, I represent the type one diabetes, right? Helmsley, one of the programs is type one. So we should go to all the countries and build a care for, for, for type one, but it doesn't work because if you have to build 
a clinical model for type 1 than a clinical model for Crohn's disease or for any, any chronic disease. This is not sustainable, not in low and middle income countries, but any country on the world. So for a long time, actually since the inception of the global access portfolio, we support PEN Plus, which is an integrated clinical model that provides care for type 1 diabetes, sickle cell anemia, rheumatic and congenital heart diseases. Yeah. Uh, it has been, uh, we started actually by, we started the support and then you have a number of other funders coming, JDRF, uh, UNICEF, the World Diabetes uh, Foundation, American Heart Association. So you have now a coalition of funders to move a clinical model that have shown that it's cost-effective and impactful. We started by supporting um, in Rwanda, by supporting Pen Plus in Rwanda and Haiti. A few years after, we supported in addition Malawi and Liberia, yeah. and in, in more recently in another 12, I think 12 countries, maybe more. But the highlight of our summer it was that the WHO Afro actually adapted Pen Plus as a strategy to, yeah. uh, to provide clinical care for the three diseases I mentioned. I think Pen Plus, is, this is what I'm talking about, meaningful partnership. It's partnership with local implementers, with advocates. You need the country, the country ministers of health. You need the, you need the people, everyone. You need everyone to work together in order to have an integrated model that it's appropriate for the yeah. environment of the, of the health system. So I just, I, I just keep talking about meaningful partnerships because I think for me, you know, I don't ever want to say, I will partner with this health provider and if the health provider doesn't want to partner with me, this doesn't work. So I think as a funders, as a global, as a glo global advocates, I, I, even you, I mean, uh, Claudia, at the Access to, uh, Access to Medicine Foundation, you think beyond insulin, okay? Because yeah. even if you create something for insulin, then what about all the other drugs? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I think partnership and integration, it's extremely, it's an extremely thoughtful way to make, uh, to make people's lives better. Exactly. I think now we have sort of the very, uh, I guess, difficult challenge of, of how to bring some of these sort of ideas forward, how to move sort of companies, but also other partners to play their parts when it comes to improving access to insulin. And, and today we have touched upon some of the, I guess, chronic issues and the gaps that we see uh, for people living with, with type 1 diabetes in low and middle income countries. We also know that there are some opportunities. I think there are plenty of opportunities. And as we were outlining before, uh, it may be a key moment for us to, to really propel access forward uh, and to really take action. So uh, now I guess I, I just wanted to hear from you. Maybe I'll start with a couple of points that I see as important and something that we, we have highlighted in the report as kind of key next steps for ramping up access. And obviously this is sort of a very, at a very high level, but things that we feel are extremely important. I think uh, we've mentioned this before, but I think the discrete initiatives by industry, whether that's donation, pediatric programs, or sort of very individual strategies is not what is ultimately going to improve the health system in the long term. Uh, and we desperately need for, for these initiatives to actually become overarching strategies uh, and for companies to work locally and with other partners, as, as you were mentioning, Gina, to, to ensure that they become integrated in the, in the healthcare system. Um, I think the second point that comes uh, quite strongly in our report is that insulin analogs and human insulin, they should be both uh, be available for healthcare practitioners and patients so they have choices of the treatments that are more, most suitable for them. Countries should still continue to prioritize reimbursement for human insulin, of course, but at the same time, companies need to make more efforts to extend their affordability strategies. And maybe they can think about what, the, what they have done for human insulin um, to really bring those uh, ideas into analog so they can become better integrated, not only into the health system, but um, as a way to really offer affordable treatments to patients. And I, I would like to add a final point, maybe, uh, and, and this is something that we haven't yet covered, and we didn't really talk 
in detail within within this one conversation, but there is a real promise in biosimilar products. Um, mm -hmm. So the efforts around registration that I was mentioning earlier, uh, they also need to expand for biosimilar products, right? And companies can take advantage of, of sort of mechanisms to be able to register in low and middle income countries to bring, bring those products to people. Um, and at the same time, um, the regulatory processes, and I think you, you touched upon it also, and, and sort of the greater capacity within national regulatory authorities will also be needed. Um, so the biologics, uh, the biosimilars, they live up to their promise of more affordable uh, products. And I think um, I think these are all really important steps, obviously not comprehensive, but I was wondering if you had to sort of set out a call to action or, or the three key things that you would see in addition to what I've said, are there any other points that you would uh, bring forward? My points are not very different from yours and I really thank you for this insightful and compelling insights. And I think one part I would say that it's and what I see from the report is actually the need for industry to think bigger. Yeah. Industry meaning not only the three companies, but the biosimilar companies. Exactly. To think to think bigger, to hope bigger, and and to actually to have bigger actions. So as you said, registering essential products, particularly uh, analogs, it's very important. Increasing attention on commercially sustainable models which provide affordable insulins, again, including analogs. And I think my third point, it was actually to pursue partnerships with pri prioritizing integrating products for national health system. As we both say the same song, it has to be in the national health systems. But I want really to maybe say my last piece that I really, at the beginning, I thought I said, I was thinking to say, I hope, but it's, I believe, I'm going to change this. I believe that our today's conversation is just the beginning. Uh, it's just the beginning that we look, we have to look beyond one disease. We have to understand the totality of the, of the life of a, of a person. They live a, and they live in an interacting web of health, yeah. economic, and social challenges. So what I would say, whether we are healthcare providers, whether we are policy makers, advocates, people with type 1 diabetes, we have to work together across diseases. It, as you said at the beginning, it has been 100 years since the, the, the discovery of insulin. What are we waiting for? And I'll stop here. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. I don't think there's anything else to add. I think I just want to end on that note. Uh, and actually, your words really, really uh, summarize and encapsulate uh, also our position um, in terms of what we need moving forward. Uh, so thank you so much. And I would invite everyone to read the report and also to, to keep in touch and just see uh, sort of the different actions and activities that are happening in this space. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you, you, Claudia, for an excellent conversation.